Excellent. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Casey, and I am the Associate Director of Graduate Career Services at Tufts. Um, it is a privilege to be able to, uh, to be with you today, to be able to share some ideas and insights around interviewing. Um, I think this is traditionally a, a very important topic around career planning, uh, given the current state of the marketplace and changes in styles and, and preferences and technologies. Um, I think it's ever more important to understand, you know, what expectations are in the marketplace and what organizations are looking for and how you can best prepare for, uh, to answer the questions that are going to be presented to you. So uh, just a little bit of background about me. So I've been at, at Tufts for the last uh, about 10 months. Uh, this is a dedicated resource for graduate students, which is excited. Uh, the first one that Tufts has had full time, uh, that, that I, as I understand it. So my role is specifically helping graduate students across, across all of the career process and continuum. Um, I do have experience as an executive recruiter, so have some understanding about how organizations source talent and how we prepare candidates for interviewing for organizations. Uh, I also run my own career coaching practice for the last 10 years, so I have experience, you know, what it's like to, to transition from an entrepreneurial role to um, back into a marketplace. Um, and I've worked in industry for about 10 years before that. So uh, all that is just to say is uh, I've been fortunate enough to have a lot of varied and varied, uh, varied experiences that uh, hopefully will bear the, the conversation here. Um, and if it's possible, if for those of you who haven't muted your phones, would you, would you or your computers make sure you do that now, please? So let's get into this. So I imagine many, if not all of you recognize this logo. And I think when a lot of us see this logo, thing, a variety of things come to our minds initially. Transportation, convenience, technology, um, to some degree, some bad press, uh, the fact that they, they just bought Postmates, um, uh, a more expensive option. So, uh, but certainly a, a convenience. And I think for a lot of other, you know, a lot of you have used this and understand this logo as well. A lot of the same features, but I've heard sometimes it's convenient, it's less expensive, um, it's less stuffy. I've heard things about um, it has it's the logo with the mustache. So um, similar organization, similar roles and responsibilities, but a different set of expectations. I imagine many of you recognize this logo as well. I think the words that have come to mind from a lot of folks that have talked about it is German and performance and elegance and speed. Somebody once mentioned, uh, this is the pair, this is the car our parents drive. Uh, conversely, you have <clears throat> this logo in this organization and things that people have come to mind saying, German, performance, the ultimate driving machine, um, hugging the road, expensive. Uh, so we've just gone over four different, different brands and this conversation is not an exercise in brand awareness or understanding or preferences. But here's the thing why this frame of mind matters. The exact same process that we as consumers use to decide between two competing products in the same category is exactly the same process a hiring manager uses to discern between two competing candidates for the same role for a job. So from a career services standpoint at Tufts, what we are aiming to do is how can we best prepare you to be the preferred candidate for each of the roles that you seek and ideally prepare you ultimately with, you know, with interview styles and expertise so you have the competitive advantage to land that opportunity. This is one of the most important slides that I believe we share in career services. And I think from a contextual standpoint, it's critical is recognizing the fact that career planning is a process where the idea is that for many of you, um, you may have engaged the career center at Tufts or at your alma maters elsewhere 
Um, some of you may have not. Most of the time, engagement in career centers is focused on resumes and cover letters. Um, and those are incredibly vital aspects of the career planning process. But everybody at any, any given time falls along, is falling along one of these places in the spectrum. You may know exactly what you want and you want to go out and get it and have a job search strategy. You may have no idea where to start and figuring out where exploration starts in, in self-discovery. Some of you may be at a place where you've given a job offer and you want to be able to negotiate. But just recognizing the fact that we as a career services department and my, myself in particular will help you meet, meet you where you're at. So for today's conversation is, is certainly around interview preparation. The second most important thing probably about this conversation around interviewing is the most essential aspect of interview preparation and planning is self-understanding and awareness. It is impossible to understand and serve all the interests and understand all the needs and provide context for an organization without having a clearer understanding of the, of the breadth of who you are. What you have in front of you is a simplified diagram of a personal inventory form. What this is designed to do is help us understand the details of who you are. And what we try to do is, you know, when you're thinking about interviewing and interview prep, a lot of those conversations are, you could technically be asked anything within a certain, uh, certain boundary. What we want to be able to do is how do you, you know, what could they possibly ask and what are they actually asking and, and have you done your due diligence about what that information is and how do you retrieve it? So these are six categories that we think are essential for individuals to understand bef about themselves before they get into an interview setting. And I will I'll just review them very, very briefly. First is interests and passions. It's important to understand what you like, what you, what you enjoy, what you love to do. It is important to recognize that it is not just about your jobs and your, your, your vocation and not just about your academic experience. We're talking about your life, is that you're, you're bringing your entire self to bear within an organization. So understanding what is important and interesting to you is, is incredibly helpful. The next thing is skills and competencies. What can you do? What, what do you like to do? What do you love to do? What do you hate to do? What are you great at and never want to do again? And I imagine for a lot of us um, in our careers or our, our academic backgrounds, this holds very true. Many of you may have, have decided to go to graduate school for the very reason of wanting to move on to something else that, that leverages what you'd like to be able to do and, and what you like to do. Um, so that's when we think about interviewing prep is those categories usually come to the forefront. It's the other ones that are essential. So the next one is attributes and descriptions. And this is about sort of brand awareness and understanding who, you know, who you are and how you describe yourself. So how do you perceive yourself? How would you describe yourself? How would others, uh, how would others describe you? This is a making sure that, you know, it's that, how you are articulating yourself and how you think about things and the words you use to describe yourself are authentic to you and you are able to communicate them to an interviewer. The fourth one is values and motivators. And this is sort of higher order responsibilities. So like what is essentially important to you? Is it, it could mean it's anything, it, family, economy, the climate, uh, uh, the organization itself. But the idea being is that, you know, you may have fundamentals of a job that are exciting for you and the work looks great, but the ethos of the organization doesn't align with you. Like if you're, you know, if sustainability is important and the organization you work for doesn't have a process or, or, or has a, doesn't have a consistent track record of, of sustainability and conservation that aligns with you, that may be a disconnect from the role overall. The next one, styles and preferences, and this is critical. This is how do you like to work? How do you like to work with others? How do others like to work with you? What's the worst boss you've ever had, or worst PI you've ever had? So what this is identifying is your style, is that do you want to work 40 hours? Do you want to work 80 hours? Do you want to, you, how much flexibility do you want in your job? Um, what kind of attributes do you want in a boss? 
how do you like to lead? How do you like to be led? How do you want to be managed? So recognizing how the work, the environment in which you're in and the work and, and how in which it's delivered is, is critical to understand. And the last thing is goals and expectations. This is why you're doing the work that you're doing. You know, what is the, what are you trying to get out of that experience? Um, some of those are internal, a lot of them are external. You know, do you want to retire at 30? Do you want to buy a house? Uh, do you want to travel the world? Do you want to have a family? So the idea is that your goals and expectations are, are a fundamental aspect, a category of consideration when you're thinking about the work that you're doing. You know, it could be an incredible opportunity, you know, but if the role is, is 3,000 miles away and you don't want to work there, you know, and your goal is to stay closer to family, then, that's, then there's a category or a criteria that you understand and, and be able to figure out. So this tool is, I think, is important for, for everybody. It's a conceptual exercise, although I think there is intrinsic value in putting, um, actually writing things into a document like this. And if working with career services, if you bring in a document like this, and, and like, then we can share it with you, and you populate it, we can speak to it. But here's why it matters to interview prep. Aside from industry specific technical questions, every interview question you will ever get for the rest of your life will come out of these six categories. So doing preparatory work in that aspect actually does allow you to save time and prepare, I believe, prepare more effectively. So let's say you have done your your personal due diligence you've done you've done the work on yourself this is what i'm about this is what the information this is what i know and that you know and these things could evolve what do i do with that so let's say you are applying for a job and in this case we're going to use an example is you know you're looking for an opportunity and most often there is a position description created about that role to tell potential candidates about what that opportunity looks like and how to apply for it. There are a million ways to, to, to access this. You find them on job boards, you'll find them on Handshake, you'll find them on Indeed. You can find them on at, uh, through recruiters and placement agencies. You might find them on association web boards, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I imagine most of you have, if, have used or seen or applied through mechanism like this. So within this document, they're created by hiring managers and recruiters to showcase the breadth of this information. What we wanna help people understand is how do you dissect and deconstruct this position description for what they're actually asking for? So you can prepare specifically for what you think those, those questions might be for your interviewing. So what we have done is created a framework to think about opportunities and how to evaluate them. Again, it's a conceptual tool. You don't necessarily have to populate this, but it is a way to, to think more concretely about how you fit a particular role. In this particular case, on the left-hand side of, this, of this, these boxes are responsibilities for this role. They are they're, uh, pulled specifically and accurately from the previous slide. So what, we try to do is like, you know, the first thing is lead cross-functional DEI work group. Understanding how well your skills align with that job is critical. And if you're, if you believe there's a gap in that skills, how would you think about developing that skill portfolio to increase your, um, your aptitude for that role? But the other thing is, is how interested are you in that thing? Because as you're evaluating a variety of opportunities, understanding does the most important thing that they're looking for resonate with you? I think this is a critical exercise in the fact that when you're applying for jobs, the ones that are, a lot of times it's easier to, to land opportunities that are better fits because we feel better connected to them. It doesn't mean those are all the jobs you have to focus on, but this at least is a construct to be able to evaluate not only aptitude, but desire. And we can do the same thing for qualifications. What are they actually looking for? They're looking for five years of experience. They're looking for specific expertise in these areas. They're looking for these types of roles and responsibilities. They're looking for these kind of qualities. Again, these are ways to delineate, but these were qualifications. If you'll notice, <clears throat> some are technical, some are skill-based, um, natural relationship builder and intuitive personnel, personnel uh, interpersonal skills are uh, attributes. So you can start 
seeing where these, these these function categorically. But what I think is helpful as a way to evaluate opportunities that you're looking for in preparation, we did create a career path evaluation matrix, which allows you to quantify an overall fit for a role and what you pursue for opportunities. This may seem it goes back, if you're already interviewing, why would I do this? But the idea is that as you're you know, evaluating and applying and ascertaining opportunities, the ability to quantify subjectively to a certain degree and score the role you're looking for is helpful because it helps you understand, is this the type of work that I want to do and how I want to be able to do it and where I want to do it and when I want to do it? With the idea is that, you know, the higher the scores and categories and overall, and overall scores can be helpful to understand because they may be better fits. So I think it's helpful to understand that this tool exists. And as you're thinking about opportunities, under, the overall aspect is that making sure you really break down what an organization is asking for in the role and understanding the organization itself is really critical because those are the types of questions that will be asked in an interview. So you've found what you're looking for, you're excited and you've applied for the job and they might be interested. So certainly I think this is probably universal, but certainly in, in the US, oftentimes interviews start with a phone screen. Oftentimes with organizations, it is not necessarily with a hiring manager, which is the person who actually you might be working for or the team or, the, or the, the group you might be connecting with. A lot of times it's a filter from human resources to understand basic questions about you to screen you whether or not they want to bring you in for an interview. And typically bringing you in was, was in person as we're, you know, as, as we're talking about now, the virtual landscape is, <laughs> is where it's at. But the idea is that oftentimes those questions around that initial interview are around interests and why it was interesting to you. They might be asking about what your timing is and what your availability and to entertaining other options. Um, they may ask about salary expectations or compensation expectations. My strong recommendation is to not discuss compensation and we'll discuss some, some reasons why a little bit later. Um, when it certainly becomes the negotiation is that we want to make sure that you are being hired based on your value, your, your perceived value and your market value, not around an arbitrary number that was, um, was shared with an organization. So let's say you pass the phone screen. Usually it's a, a smaller constituencies of individuals and those, those interviews can be one-on-one. -on -one. There may be one round, there may be five rounds. It depends on industries. Um, it is not unheard of in something like consulting, for instance, where you might have five different interviews and three of them are, in, are consecutive in-person ones. One is a case study and one is a, is a panel interview. So there are a variety of different ways that an organization will put people together and tools together to ask you questions, to get information about you, to see if they want you to work with them. And with the idea is that organizations are looking for, do we find you valuable? Do we like you? And do we want to pay you for it? And that's where we're trying to focus our energies in these conversations. And then number four is, uh, is the negotiation part is, you know, ideally is that you've, you've been offered, offered the role and then, you know, do you want to take it? And if so, you know, under what conditions? When you're interviewing and this is true with whether or not it's virtual and in person. 60% of an interview is nonverbal, which means 60% of the time, no one is speaking. And I think that's a critical thing to, to recognize because it allows you to prepare effectively overall and holistically for an interview, recognizing the fact that the, the information that comes out of you is absolutely essential, but recognizing all the other aspects of the interview process is unhelpful. Thinking about how you, how you dress, how you, how you align yourself, how you prepare your room, how your body language, things like, and we don't, we don't have to go through, you know, all of these pieces, but just recognize the fact like there are behaviors like mirroring, which is a style in which if you were interviewing with somebody, 
you're mirroring their behavior. So if they're crossing their arms, you're crossing your arms. Or if they're pivoting the side, you're pivoting the side. If they're moving forward a little bit, you're moving forward a little bit. It's a subconscious way to, to develop connection with the interviewer. Um, things like, you know, do you bring a notepad into an interview? I think absolutely. Um, is it okay to take notes? Is that, is, that's non-verbal? Yes, it's absolutely. In fact, I think it's, I think it's highly desirable to bring notes and make sure you're capturing information, especially it's helpful down the line around following up. So as you're thinking about interview prep and developing your skill set, you know, for the roles you're looking for, these are things that certainly the Career Development Center can help you with, not just about the question preparation, but how you overall prepare your posture and setting and eye contact and delivery in a way that is effective and meaningful. I just mentioned briefly um, how we present ourselves aesthetically, you know, in recognizing, you know, what, what is appropriate. I will just say, you know, when there's a time when it's more common to move back towards in-person interviewing, you know, the one recommendation I always have is that, is make the investment in professional clothes that are consistent with the expectation of the role you're looking for because not everybody not every organization is expecting uh formal attire suit and ties etc but also but also um understanding that the default i would say if there's ever any worry about that is to default to formal and especially in person is making the investment in clothing that fits well, is tailored well, and makes you feel well and happy and consistent. It does have an effect. I think making an investment in uh, tailoring your outfit, uh, the right tie or the right belt or the right shoes or the right pants, um, because that's, that's the first perception anyone's going to have of their experience with you. So, and again, from the career services standpoint, we can always discuss, you know, what that might look like and, uh, more helpful. Now, with a virtual setting, I think it's important too, is that I think it's still reasonable to, and I actually, to some degree, agree with it, is dress as if you're going to an in-person interview. So you've, you've created, a, in, you know, uh, an individual environment for yourself where you're, you've prepared for this experience as if you were going to professionally engage an organization and sell your, your, your value to them. But at least, you know, at least what it's, what, you know, what's visual. So again, um, aesthetics and presentation are, are, are incredibly important in the process. This is again, in a, uh, in a socially engaged world, in-person world, the idea is um, a handshake is really critical for an interview. And this is a, this is actually something interesting because uh, handshake and engagement is very different, you know, um, internationally. For the U.S., for an in-person, firm handshake, making direct eye contact with um, the people that you're meeting. So. Because that does set that does set an expectation for you know what they're going to be doing. So just understanding from a U.S. point of view is that if a firm handshake, <laughs> that extreme squeezing with eye contact is the expectation. Now, the virtual world is where I think we're all trying to figure things out. Is that okay, man? I've interviewed multiple times. I've done multiple things. I have an expectation. I think I've felt successful, but now. <clears throat> I've lost the ability to provide, to, to manage my own environment within the space of somebody else's. Now it's, there's a two dimensional barrier between us. What do we do? So these are, are some tips that I, uh, one organization, actually I think the psychology today does some significant research about this and making sure you're prepared effectively. Um, we don't have to go through all of these, but you know, quickly how you are set up so the lighting that you have and making sure you're either front lit with a lamp or you are facing a window that's giving ambient light in front of you because because it looks more professional and more healthy and engaging 
making sure you're checking all your technical elements and practicing. If, if these are things you haven't done for platforms you haven't used, making sure that you prepare and do run throughs if possible ahead of time to make sure all your systems are in place. Now, recognizing that there's such a sudden change and we've moved to a completely virtual world, it is possible, if not likely, that there will be times when Wi-Fi isn't working or computers don't work and things get disconnected. I think there's a level of flexibility organizationally and for a hiring perspective about what that might look like for people. So don't be overly distraught if your Wi-Fi kicks out and you have to connect back in or you lose your video for a minute. I think there's a level of, of understanding and flexibility and accommodating that is going to come with that. Making eye contact that I, uh, I mentioned, framing yourself, making sure that, and this I think is critical, is having your computer or your web camera facing evenly with your eye level. So you're actually looking like you're interviewing somebody at your eye, at your eye level, like you're meeting them in person. Um, stack them on books, whatever, whatever, works, whatever works for you. Um, I think the dressing head to toe, removing distractions. I think that's critical. You know, I think having a Spartan background is important or just, or having something that's, when you have things behind that can distract the audience, if they're trying to read the novel that's over your, your shoulder while you're interviewing, that could distract from, from your brand. I think virtual backgrounds can be very useful if done effectively. So there's no specific expectation of what a virtual background should look like. Um, that's something you can, you can certainly read about or we can talk about what that might look like best for you. But recognize the fact that a lot of noise and a lot of things moving around the background and too much color can be distracting. Um, so again, we're not even talking about questions yet, but what we are talking about is that, is that all of this preparation ahead of time is going to make the rest of your conversations significantly easier. So we talk about common questions and considerations. So the interviewing is going to, or about to, or is happening. I think discussing what some essentials are uh, is very important. Interviewing is a skill. It is something that you can and should practice to get better at. Everyone has a different level of, of comfort and skill at extemporaneous conversation, talking off the cuff. And that's, and that can be very helpful, but recognizing that <clears throat> how to recognize what a question, what question is being asked, um, what information you have, how, which answer am I going to come up with? How am I going to formulate those pieces? How should I deliver that aspect? And <clears throat> there are some virtual tools and resources that we have that can help with, with that process as well. I mentioned earlier is doing your research not only digging into the job itself, being very aware of what the company does or the organization you're applying for does, what they've done historically, reading uh, press releases, uh, releases if they have them, understanding um, if they've been growing or, or if they've made acquisitions or they brought on, on new people, but really, and then if you can get even insights into the teams and the types of work they're doing that's directly related to what you're doing or what their competitors are doing can be really helpful. Um, and then making sure if you are given a list of people that you're going to be interviewing with is doing your research on them. It is essential and completely commonplace. If you have names is to go to LinkedIn and go to the, pro the profiles of the people you're going to interview with. Look at how long, uh, where they've worked, where they went to school, how long they've worked and where they've done, what they have, you know, what their degrees are in, uh, what other organizations they've been with, uh, what affiliations they have. So like any conversation, that's giving people the ability to, to connect with an interviewer uh, on areas of interest or commonality with them. So, you know, people call it, you know, LinkedIn stalking. I don't believe that that's true. There's 700 million people on LinkedIn and about 65 million jobs and internships. It is the social currency of the professional world, and it is the expectation that you do your research. Um, 
the third piece is, is, is critical. It is a conversation and not a race. It is not about speed of delivery that wins. It is about context and comfort and relatability that matter. It is completely appropriate if you're asked a question and you're not immediately prepared to answer, it is uh, prudent and acceptable to say, um, may I have a moment to provide you with my best answer? Not only does it look thoughtful, it's incredibly professional, and it's what we'd expect for somebody that was working for an organization. So just recognizing the fact that it's okay to pause, it's okay to take a breath. Um, you know, there's a reason why mindfulness is, is becoming, you know, has been and it continues to be a big practice is the idea is be able to breathe and to center yourself and to give yourself some space to think and check in with yourself. So, um, and that it's, and I think the conversation piece is critical because is that it's, it's not a unilateral conversation. It is a conversation between, let's say, two or more people about value. You know, there's an organization that has a need and they're looking for somebody to fill that need under these terms. But you also have a need and expectations and you're trying to fill them as well. So what we're trying to do is make a, is make a thoughtful match. So don't think of, I wouldn't think about going into interviews as being um, inferior to the organization in which you're trying to apply. The idea is that it is, it is trying to match need and value with need and value. It is easy to get distracted in interviews. You might get questions that, that you've never heard or never thought about. There could be things going uh, around the room. It, it, uh, the person you interviewed with may look distracted or, or twiddling their thumbs or, or not being engaged with the conversation and that might throw you off. What's really, really important is to make sure when, an, when asked a question is that you completely answer that question regardless of how you feel about it. It may be off the wall, it may be inconsequential, it may not be relatable in, in your mind. It is not our job to try to discern what the, what the, um, what the interviewer is trying to, to ascertain and trying to understand. What we're trying to do is, is make sure is that whatever you hear and try and understand that question to be and process it is that you deliver that answer. You know, this is the answer to your question that's being asked because it's very easy to get on a tangent or, or, or lose track or, or deliver something else that doesn't make sense. But I think this, is, this really does change the game because how often it does happen. So, and then this is something that you certainly be prepared for. And again, I, I mentioned this a few times already in our conversation, it's about value creation and interest. The idea is to be able to showcase for an organization how you're connected to the work that you're doing and what you've done with it and what you've done as a process to, to get ready for it, how you've delivered it, how you've evaluated it, how you've shared it with other folks. Um, so that can be for a professional landscape, but we're also interviewing around our interest level and our connection with people because culture is a huge aspect of fit right now. And even in a virtual landscape, trying to, you know, making sure you're building teams with, with, with consistent and complementary styles is really important. An example I'll give is that it's very easy to enter, you know, I think it's what well, you can be interviewed and get the information you want as an interviewer without interviewing somebody necessarily on the topic that you're, or the role that you're being looked at. So for instance, if I've looked at your background and understanding, and let's say it's not a, like specifically or hyper-technical um, interview. There was one student I worked with, uh, worked with several years ago and I was looking through the resume and at the bottom it said, you know, from, a, from an interest standpoint, was a um, internationally ranked badminton player. And I thought that was fascinating. It wasn't for a badminton job. So for 20 minutes, having a conversation with this person about, you know, because it's something I'm interested in, something I want to know more about and how does it work internationally. And, technique and practice style and preparation and interest in those pieces and who you like to do it for and and what do you get out of that or how competitive are you when you do those things so those six categories that we talked at in an inventory before i can get to that information from a lot of different angles so just being aware that it might not just be running through your research or running through 
the last few jobs that you had or your degree that you got. It could be around anything. But if you recognize that all of, you know, individual elements or interests can be related back to all those categories is important. So there are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of questions that can be asked during interview. Um, these are examples of ones that feel common and ones that I think create a, a level of, of uh, apprehension and maybe nerves around a uh, different reason. Maybe they're too nebulous. Maybe they're too, they're too big. They're, they're too constricted. Here's some insights around some, some of these big ones. You know, First one's tell me about yourself. That one can feel incredibly overwhelming. We feel from a career you know, services standpoint that this is an incredibly oppor uh, incredible opportunity because what the interviewer has done has given you complete control of your story. So understanding how you want to deliver that information is important. Recognizing that you, whatever your story can be is, can showcase where the value and interest and relatability is. So you can have somebody said, tell me about yourself and you can run it reverse chronologically. I'm currently a graduate student in Tufts School of Engineering focusing on A, B, and C. Um, I pursued this for these reasons. Before I did this, I spent three years working here and two years doing this. And then I went to school before that. And you know, I, that's why I'm interested in that job. Again, I'm paraphrasing very quickly, but it's just say from a chronological standpoint. But Let's say it's a job you, you know, you're very excited to want to do and, and it's working with the type of work they're wanting to be doing. You know, you can start the conversation as a, in an in, in a individualized way. You can say it's, you know, I've wanted to work in robotics since I was six. Nobody is going to cut you off after that sentence because they're going to want to know the answer of why that's true for you. And then you, you know, shaping the story, you know, I, uh, I learned to do it this way and I've competed in these competitions and I realized I like math and these aspects and instruction, but I realized, you know, as I've been going through this process and going my undergraduate degree, I learned these things. But as a graduate student, I realized, you know, human technology interaction is completely different. And now I want to pivot to this reason. And your company has been focusing on this for three years and that's exciting to me. And that's why I'd love to work here. This is just quick framing. But what it's saying is that you have a lot of flexibility in your story and you can tell them about, again, I get value keeps coming up over and over in this conversation, but it's critical because that's what, that's what they're buying. Um, why do you want to work here is, is a similar piece. This is where doing your research in the organization becomes critical. Um, understanding what they've done, who they've done it for, where they've done it. But this is an important uh, piece to, uh, to share with everybody is the interview is not about you, even though it is a conversation and it is bilateral. The, in, the conversation is about them and what you can do for them because, it, because they're making the purchasing decision. So why you wanna work here is within, uh, typically within, the, within the, the construct of that organization. So, and you know, one, one trick, one style or, or one, way to answer questions and, and maybe many of you have heard this before is the rule of three and a lot of these questions fit that role the idea is that people um, subconsciously tend to absorb information and and retain it in blocks of three so the idea is that you know if, if somebody says why do you want to work here um you know i'd like to work here because i think that the innovative technology developing is going to change the way people behave in the future and that's exciting to me um, the ability to work with colleagues who are doing best in practice and uh, the role the effect that this role has research and analysis and exposure to multiple places i think and i built the competencies allow me to do those things um, and i love that it's in san diego so it doesn't necessarily have to be super you know necessarily like ex explicitly with value but the idea is that there may be 10 reasons why you want to work there there may be a hundred reasons what you've given them is a practice, it doesn't have to be verbatim, it doesn't have to be memorized, but you've given them your <clears throat> interpretation of what that, um, what that answer should be. Um, <clears throat> why are you looking now? There's such a variety of, of ways to do that, that's critical. This is a very flexible conversation, like, you know, it, 
it could be anything is that I think, you know, I'm always open looking for new opportunities. It's for this reason. I like this role that you're doing. Um, sometimes it's a professional change. Sometimes it's a personal change. This is one I think it's important to prepare for with somebody else, depending on what you're looking for. It could be, I tend to shy away from personal aspects of it um, unless they're directly relevant or it's something you feel like the, the interviewer um, will connect with. This is the one that, that always gets asked is what's your biggest weakness um, or what are, your big, what are your biggest weaknesses? Everybody has them. We expect that. This is a question not necessarily on the, on the weakness itself, um, which I don't th actually think is a particularly fair or interesting question, um, but about how you answer it. It is entirely reasonable and okay to reveal a weakness without having a solution. It doesn't have to be this is my weakness and this is all the things that I've done and I've, I've completely remedied that challenge. Um, there are some things that are not necessarily innate thing, or things that you, that your weakness that you, you struggle with and continue to work on, you know, and a lot of time, and this is where thinking about doing that due diligence at the beginning of the work and uh, how the role fits. If the <clears throat> first thing that they're looking for on, you know, a, a value they're looking for on a job description is something that you feel is a weakness, that's when being you know, critical about the fit and the connection for that role. Doesn't mean you aren't, it just means being thoughtful about it. But here's, a, you know, here's an example is that, you know, having done career playing and coaching for a long time, you know, I think from a skill perspective, you know, the ability to, to engage and ask questions and you know, create a level of comfort and, and have an individual or group dialogue like this to be able to share information and help people and organizations make the you know, informed decisions. But a part of this job is event programming and planning, you know, putting on events and getting speakers together or, or building frameworks or you know, building collaborations, things that take a lot of logistics, operations and planning. Those things are not innate for me. They're very difficult. It's, and it's something that um, I find frustrating sometimes and I find that they could be things that I'll procrastinate on. But what I have found is that, you know, when working, you know, working for great teams is that I've been able to, to work with my colleagues to make sure they understand what those things are, but also um, finding people within the organization that can help support those aspects and people that thrive in those places and have it be a collaborative effort to deliver that type of programs, to be able to use other people's skills. So I don't want to be uh, an event planner. Um, it's, it would be, be, it would be a, a struggle, but there are elements of doing that. But the idea is that it's, it's something you live with and, and this is how I manage it to make it work for me. Um, and then why should we hire you? And, you know, I think this is some, uh, similar to why, you know, why do you want to work here? But, you know, why should we hire you? Is that this is, you're selling, this is when you're selling yourself. This is like, this is between, you know, this is Uber and Lyft. This is why I'm better than the candidate sitting next to me who has similar credentials. You're reflecting back to them. And this oftentimes happens later in the interview where you have more information and context is that this is no time to be humble. You know, it's, I mean, being thoughtful in how you, you, word and communicate your answers, but we should, is that, you know, I believe my five years of experience in this place with these particular, ex, you know, things um, align well with what this group is looking for. The ability to adapt and communicate and connect under these circumstances works, um, you know, and the ability that, that I can, you know, that I can start in the next two weeks. So you've given them three things that are three easy. You haven't maybe not an understanding of what they're looking for and they're happy about it. So, but <clears throat> it is a time to relate back to them, them, what you think they perceive to be the most valuable things about what they're looking for in the candidate. Um, and there's flexibility in, into the answer. Behavioral questions are always something that people are asking about in the career services with the idea is that their questions, you know, you know, um, you know, tell me about your, your research, you're telling me about your skill set, where you're, you're, you're absorbing that information and you're feeding them back your, your perception of that thing. With a behavioral question, they're scenario based. They're asking you under, under what conditions or experiences or, or scenarios, how have you or how will you or how would you 
manage or adapt or connect with that situation. Okay, so in this in this slide here, there are just there are ten in the center to look at. You know, uh, tell me about a time you handled a challenging situation. Give me an example of how you set your goals. Tell me about a goal you set and reached and how you achieved it. There are many ways to answer this question. There is a framework that's been created that can be helpful for, for many of us to, to package that solution. And this is bigger it's called the STAR method. And STAR stands for situation, task, action, and result. So when they're asking behavioral questions, you know, the idea is that the S in STAR is situation. You are framing the situation for them, the context in which you're going to talk about this things, you know, what that challenging situation would have been and where was it, and who was it for and, and how, you know, how was it, when was it? Then you're getting into specifics is the task and the action. Is that, what did you, you know, now that they've identified what that thing is, what did you do about it? You know, how did you identify, how did you connect with, who did you work with? Um, how did you deliver it? What complications did you face when you were in the middle of that thing? What challenges did you have to work through? You know, and then finally result. And that's a delivery is that, well, how did you, what was the outcome of that challenging, let's say in this particular question, what your challenging question is. So what you've done, and this is very much like, um, for those of you, you know, having resumes and CVs, is creating a bullet in your CV about value, is that this is, this is why you should care about this situation. Um, and the result does matter. <clears throat> but the result could be, we didn't get the contract, or it didn't work, or um, it created dissonance with my colleagues, or, um, or whatnot. But what they're asking, the situation questions are asking you how you, is how you work within something. But it can touch on all of those six aspects, again, of that personal inventory form. This is something you can write down. These are things you can practice. These are things you can practice with us. You can practice on your own or with, with others. Um, you don't have to use the STAR method. This is just one that's, that's, um, has been recommended, it is consistent. Um, but at the end of the day, <clears throat> again, we're still going back to this either. context, value, and outcome. So you've gone through your interview, and let's say it could be a group interview, it could be one-on-one. -on -one. For each individual interview, the expectation is that you will ask questions. There is no perfect job where everything they share is exactly what you want. And even if that did exist, you still need to ask questions because it shows a conscientious effort to understand more about the organization, more about what they can do for you or, what are, or nuances that you may not have thought about before. But understanding this is the expectation. So these are three examples. So if you're trying to think about what should I, what, what could I ask? So one of the ones people always tend to say is, you know, you know, what's the company culture like here? You know, what is it like, you know, what is it like to work here? I think asking very open-ended nebulous questions um, can be distracting and challenging because not everybody likes to answer questions in those frameworks. So I think giving, giving a little structure to your question is helpful and to be able to get the same information. So example, you know, for example, in this first one, is that in your experience, what are the characteristics of the most successful new hires here? So let's say you're uh, an intern or you're, uh, you're just coming out of grad school for this new world. So you're asking, you know, let's say the hiring manager, you're asking this person to give their perspective about what they value the most in the people that they've recently hired for. So if somebody said, we like, you know, uh, the most recent hires are on time, they are dedicated, they are technically competent, um, they are uh, multilingual, they are conversant in multiple experiences, et cetera. So what you've done is you've asked the interviewer to give you a whole story about their perspective of something and then understanding, do, does that answer work for you? Like, does, you know, if this, if that's your boss, if like, if does that, you know, if they describe values or interests or expectations, do those, do those meet? Do that, is that exciting for you? Because this is, you know, these are elements that are going to help you evaluate jobs, whether, you know, should you get an offer? You know, the next two are, are I said, are connected. 
but let's say you know who you're interviewing with and, and you've done your research on LinkedIn, for instance. This is a way to say, you know, what is it about the organization that has kept you here for the last X amount of time? So this is a question to ask somebody, let's say they've been at the organization for five years. So what you're asking them for is again, to tell you all about why they've made these choices to be in this role. The answers you're gonna get are not always the ones you're going to expect. There are gonna be times when people are very revealing and say, I'm here because my two kids are in school and I get tuition reimbursement full for that package. Or it's, it works well because my family situation works well because of my expertise or my age or whatever they decide they wanna, they wanna share with you. Um, and the same thing is for the next question is, um, again, if, if uh, and so the, the, the same question is, you know, what is it about the role that encourages you to move from your previous organization? This can be done for somebody that, that has left years ago or, or most recently, but what you're asking is what, was the, what were the criteria that you decided was important to you and, this, and you decided to make the choice to, to go here. And oftentimes they're gonna tell you how successful that's been. So again, you're getting a lot, you're asking a very thoughtful question with very specific boundaries that's going to deliver a ton of information that you would unlikely get if you just asked an open-ended one. These are just examples. It's just, it's just a place to start and there are again, ways to practice and, and evaluate. Um, and I know moving, uh, I know we're moving pretty quickly and uh, hopefully if, uh, if you have to get off, this will be recorded, but um, I can, there's a few more slides I'll be able to share with you that might go over the next hour. So I hope that's okay with everybody. Um, this particular slide is around um, soft skills companies are looking most in 2020. Um, soft skills are, uh, they're skills that typically are hard to quantify. So let's say you have, you have a skill and you know how to program in Python, or you know how to use Excel, or you know how to build a robot. Those are things that you can evaluate, quantify, and measure. Soft skills are often things that are, that are hard to measure on their own, um, but that you can sort of measure them in the context. But these are just two different lists of what organizations are looking for. So when you're thinking about you know, answering questions in interviews, and it's, a, it's harder to, to capture soft skills in resumes and cover letters, um, even into LinkedIn profiles uh, and, and other, um, other digital profiles. So just recognizing the fact that these are the things that the organizations are looking for and be able to weave these concepts in can be very helpful. You know, if, if, if you're talking about why are you valuable, you, you don't just have to talk about hard skill, you can talk about your ability to collaborate and persuade or be adaptable or connect you know, with emotional intelligence or, or be service oriented. So just understanding that, the, you know, it isn't an exhaustive list, but this is a consistent list. Um, there's multiple sources that are grabbing this information, but it's very helpful for people for, for you to understand and, and draw from. Uh, this is something that I learned um, in my last professional job before I started my career coaching company 10 years ago. I was working, I was, a, uh, I was in my penultimate interview with a senior product manager and it went well. And she says, who are you meeting with next? And I said, I'm meeting with Mike. And she's like, excellent. You are going to have to close the deal with Mike. And I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, and she's like, Mike is the, the senior vice president of sales and marketing for this organization. He's been doing, he's been a sales professional for the last 25 years. He's as good at what he does in this industry as anybody in the world. His job is engaging with people, understanding their needs, trying to deliver value and asking for their business. He's like, you do not get, you do not get the sell you don't ask for. If you don't ask him for the job, you will not get it. Um, and it was sage advice because I had to, adapt on the fly, but you know, ended up doing it and thankfully got the job. This is just to say at whether or not you're prompted at the end of an interview to, if there have any additional questions or any additional comments, or you're not, should be volunteered. There should be no ambiguity at the end of any interview that you are interested, valuable, and excited about the role. And that they, so the idea is that, again, it, it, it could be a lump of three, 
but the idea is that you know I think this is you know I love the fact that this organization is working on these these problems. I've dedicated the last five years of my time and, and, and energy academically and professionally to develop these skill sets. And you're doing it from what I understand with, with colleagues that 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 have these type of skills or styles or values that I that I love. And should the opportunity present this present itself, I would love to work here. So you just told them you want the job. And it's, the, you know, and it could be the last thing they remember about you. And that is a differentiator. Like, if you're thinking about two similar candidates at the same time, and one tells me at the end of it, this is why I should hire them, I'm going to remember that. Um, so just something to, to, be, to, be, to be thoughtful about. And then for follow-up, you know, this is, this is helpful. You know, yes, you follow up with every, ideally everybody that you meet with, if you can. This is why, you know, bringing in a notepad interview can be helpful or, or a portfolio, um, collecting business cards if they, you know, if people have them, which is great, who you met with. The standard is responding within 24 hours with a thank you to the people that you've met with, you, should you have, um, if you have their contact information. If you don't, you can always follow up with, your hire manager, HR, whoever, to get the additional pieces of information and personalize those messages. They do not have to be, they do not have to be mailed in letters. Although, if there's a wider timeline for that interview response for them, like maybe they're, you know, it's where this is the beginning of the interview or the beginning of their hiring process, and it could take weeks or months. Yeah, it's you could send quick follow-ups and also send personalized thank you notes, which there's a lot of impact if they're handwriting a note that's personalized to somebody else. This is why I remember, you know, taking notes or, or if your memory's strong enough to carry these things is the, you know, what individuals said and what they're about. You want to make sure that note is about what your conversation or what your experience was with that, with that element. Sometimes you get responses back from, from folks you've interviewed with, uh, or met with. Um, usually not, but it, it, it depends on the organization. Questions always ask, how long do I wait for a reply? And the benchmark is that so, so when, from when you've interviewed with, with an organization or, or interviewed multiple times, you know, when will they deliver an answer when, when you think they should hear from it? If they don't, you know, they send you an amb ambiguous timeline, I think it is reasonable to respond in 10 to 14 days. Organizations are on their own timetables and their own schedules. And we have, as, as people are applying, have no idea what those elements are. I mean, just think of, of you know, Tufts is probably a great example. Think of they're, they're probably hiring for, you know, dozens of positions, you know, pro, you know, pre-COVID, you know, and then when that happens, all these job opportunities, they may be people in, in the middle of interviewing and they might have put a pause because you have to, you know, having to, to navigate this new crazy landscape and this, this job. So, you have no idea how long this, how this time can be, I, but I think diligence can be helpful. Um, I think how many times you follow up, I think you know, every two weeks thereafter, probably for three times is helpful. Um, if you're not getting response back at all, um, thank them for their time and that you, that you continue to be interested in, and should your candidacy be um, desirable that you'd be willing to, to re, restart the conversation. So what it's doing is it's being <clears throat> thoughtful and a, you know, a little bit of a squeaky wheel gets the grease. Um, but keeping them in mind, but also recognizing the fact, recognize the fact there, you know, you should have, you know, hopefully multiple roles and opportunities that you're looking for, um, and that their timetable and desire, and you, there are going to be times, and this is, this is unfortunately, I think it's a courtesy that, that has, has lapsed in the last 20 years, is that organizations used to send either email or, or written follow-ups to say, you know, we appreciate your candidacy, but we've gone, we've gone another direction. A lot of times you just aren't hearing those things anymore. Um, I think, you know, it, it can be frustrating to not have closure in those aspects. Um, and for that, I'm sorry. I, I don't think there's any way to really remedy those pieces, but just be, just be recognize the fact that everything could have felt like it went perfectly. You never hear again. It, it just could be the style of the organization. And I'll just go very, very quickly around this because I think, in, you know, interviewing, you know, style of firm process is great, but also, you know, legally what, you know, can in, in, or, you know, can't be said. So just basic is, you know, employers can't discriminate on a variety of specific topics that are specifically in law, race, color, religion, 
uh, sex, identity, gender, age, sexual orientation, age, national origin, origin, disability. That's huge, and there's there's broad legislation in that space. But I will say, as of last year, and this is very very important to know, is that it is illegal for a company to ask you for your sal your previous salary history. They cannot ask you what you've made in your in your jobs historically. And that's a very big deal because, as I mentioned before. You may provide a salary history that's in doing the work that they're requiring. So you may have made 60,000 in your last job. They know the marketplace is, and they're willing to pay a hundred and you're worth a hundred, but they'll manage the place. They're like, well, if this person did 60, we'll just give them another 10, 15% bump and we'll make it 75. We'll make ourselves, you know, save ourselves 25,000. And that was happening all the time. And, you know, and, you know, it, and, from a negotiation standpoint, that wasn't happening is people were getting that the compensation back. So now you, so if somebody's asking you what your pay history, um, you do, you, there are, you defer, there are ways to, to talk about those, to those elements, um, but it's critical. I won't go through these other than the fact that they, they exist. So here are <clears throat> ways that organizations can ask a question about a certain topic. And here's what, you know, examples of what might be, what's illegal to ask and what is legal to ask. Um, so understanding what, the, what some of the boundaries and pieces are can be, can be helpful. Um, and this is just how, you know, a, a ways to answer these, these elements. And within this document, there are hyperlinks um, of sources all over the place. So everything you, you, know, you see in this document, and I will share this with everybody um, that participated, um, so long as you signed up on Handshake. And if you didn't, um, you're welcome to send me an email at, at matthew.casey uh, Matthew at tufts.edu. And I'll be, so I'll be able to send you the document. Um, we have a resource at Tufts called Big Interview. It is available to all undergrads and graduate students. It is a virtual interview preparation tool. It is fantastic. It allows you to prepare for interview. It's, I mean, it was designed initially for, for in-person, but to be able to just do it in front of your computer. But now it's, it's set up for virtual as well. It's an entire framework for which to practice questions generally, specifically, behaviorally. Um, <clears throat> there's dozens and dozens of industry specific uh, questions. So you can actually sort by, uh, by uh, industry area or job comps or, or title area and go through lists of these things and prepare for interviews. And what you can do is that you can actually run through the interview and you have the questions. You can actually videotape it and what, the tool actually has, they added an AI feature. So it'll give you um, specific feedback, I think on 15 or 20 different categories on your responses to your questions. So it's a way for, you know, working with the Career Center uh, with interview prep that we offer is great. Working with other people is great. This is another tool in your bag to be able to prepare effectively on your own time and schedule. And the information on, is on the uh, Tufts Career Center webpage. You can just, you can look up Tufts Big Interview and find this information. Uh, doing research uh, online about companies, I think is helpful, or, or about types of roles. If you are interviewing for a job, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of videos about interviewing for certain roles. So if you're interviewing for a product manager in biotech, there's probably a thousand people giving you advice about interview prep for biotech. So this is another tool of resource of hearing what other people say, what best practices look like. Um, YouTube is one example, but there are a variety of ones that, that can be helpful. Uh, and lastly, you know, we have a graduate student specific career services, career services pages. What we are very, very excited about is that at the um, beginning of the school year, we're launching uh, something called Uconnect, which is going to, it's more on our end, but what it's going to do is going to completely change the way we are able to engage with each other um, from a career, standing, uh, career center standpoint. Um, we're going to be able to push a lot more content. We're going to be uh, information on our about us and what is it useful for you will be delineated in much more easy ways. We're going to have industry sectors that can be helpful. Um, so look for that at the beginning of next year because it's going to be a lot, I think a lot more interesting and valuable a digital tool for you to, to help you navigate career planning. And this, this slide's typically relevant if, you know, we are still at, uh, at uh, 
in Dowling Hall in 740. Although most of next year will be virtual, we will have at least a skeleton um, presence in the office and we're, we are figuring out how to deliver it, but just so you know, most of, if not all of our services will be delivered virtually, uh, certainly for the fall. But I am grateful for the time and uh, I know I, I went over a little bit, I think there was a lot to cover. I hope it was helpful and I would gladly um, answer and stay for any and all questions people might have um, if that's if that's helpful to you. But um, interviewing is a skill and it's hard and but it can be prepared and practiced um, and that practice I assure you will make a, a considerable difference in your careers moving forward um, and we are here to help and I'm very grateful for your time. So yes anything I can answer would be happy to. Hi, I got a question. Sure. Um, so I guess organizations are always looking for work experience. So you kind of end up facing the conundrum of how do you get experience without experience? Right. So I probably apply for the job anyways, but in an interview, when they ask about work experience, how do you, how do you approach that? Sure. <clears throat> I think this is what's great about higher education now and it used to be from hiring, right? Like, where'd you get your degrees? What'd you study? And where, how, where'd you work? And that was the, that was your context of your experience. Now, experiential learning in a higher ed setting, it, it just in and of itself is, is fundamental. So when you think about um, selling aptitude, so recognizing group projects, projects in class, anything that's been delivered at all that had a result, is work that's being done. If you've spent 16 weeks on a school project with a team and built something and delivered it and, and like either created it or delivered it to a, somebody else or do, gave a class presentation, that's something that's thought, that's experience. It is highly unlikely that many of us get 16 weeks to do anything concentrated to develop that, these portfolio of skills. That's what people recognize is that is in taking advantage of those things within while you're in school is critical is that you know being part of leadership organizations but really finding opportunities to, to deliver something in anything <clears throat> this is where being very thoughtful ahead of time of what you're interested in is helpful you know if you're applying for a sales job you know out of school and you've never done sales you've never done customer service be like yeah some places will take a flyer on it but i think being thoughtful about what some of those not that it's sales but being thoughtful about those underlying skills and developing those skills can be very very helpful um, you know, and there are, you know, there are things that are going to be binary, like, like, let's say engineering or computer science, when there's very specific skills that are going to be looking for, but there's other ones that are, they're a lot more flexible and, and flowing. The job is to, and we can certainly help with that, is help translate those pieces, but <clears throat> recognizing volunteer experience, internship experience, micro internship experience, uh, entrepreneurial experience, in-class project, out-class project experience, um, on campus and off campus leadership, all of that creates a story for people. That's, and that's what we're expecting. Okay, thanks man. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, what recommendation would you have to deflect the question regarding desired salary and comp compensation? Um, that's, a great co that's a great question. Uh, one way to deliver that is that, um, You know, I think it's, I mean, you know, I, I'm incredibly interested in this job and, and the type of work that's, that's being done. Um, and, you know, should, you know, should we find alignment with my candidacy for this role? Um, I'd love to be able to, to, to better understand the, uh, the compensation or salary offerings for the organization um, and discuss it at that point. So it's not, Deflect's a really interesting word because I think it feels that way. But this is the thing with negotiation, which is is, um, is so interesting for folks, is that if organizations really want to make themselves easier, they say this is the salary range. This is the this is how much we're willing to pay for this job because this is what we have budgeted. And 
there might be flexibility to that. So then you have their range. So then you can negotiate based on piece of information that you both have. Organizations know what, how much money they have, but you don't. So it's getting them to say, to, to say the information first is, is critical. Now, if they're pressing excessively and won't go forward without some level of understanding, this is when doing due diligence on um, salary trends and market trends. <clears throat> we have third-party guides. LinkedIn Premium is really good about specific role um, salary pieces. So I'd get them to, to, to mention it first because I think it's, it's prudent. And if they really, really press on it, um, a range that makes sense and don't, don't feel self-conscious about putting the high side in. Um, because you never, you never know what they're willing to offer, what they're willing to value or how, and the fact that it's not personal. And this is what's so hard with negotiation and salaries is that it's, it's not your boss's money. Like it's, it's, I mean, technically it's, it's a budget, but ideally a, a negotiation should just be about value. And this is what, this is how we think, this is what we're willing to pay for this thing. And you negotiate effectively. So we'll give you five grand more to do that thing. Um, so recognize the fact that you know you're not they'll give you what they think you deserve based on how you create the value for them to understand what that looks like um and then for your in an application process what i usually say is um if they're asking for for salary range um just put negotiable most places will accept that some want a number um come find us we can talk about what that number might look like Perfect. Um, well, if there's, no, um, if there's no other questions, uh, I'm incredibly grateful for everybody's time. This was, uh, this was a lot of fun. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, glad it was helpful. Uh, oh, great question. Um, we will make sure the recording is available most likely on the Career Services webpage. We'll find and make sure there's a virtual link for that. Um, we also have been working with the dean's offices for the, in graduate schools and likely either you know, putting them on their YouTube pages and also the Career Center uh, also has a, a YouTube page that we're developing out. So there should be multiple platforms for this presentation and we'll probably be splicing pieces off of it that might be helpful in the future, um, but we'll be able to share that out. So those are, those are good starts. Um, wonderful. Excellent. Well, thanks very much, everybody. Uh, have a wonderful um, day enjoy the rest of your summers and i will if i don't see you before i look forward to seeing you back on campus and uh or uh, virtually in the spring or in the fall take care now